Okay, we are picking up with Act 3. Um, slight chance we'll finish this today. Uh, but probably not. We'll definitely finish it on Thursday. <coughs> so Act 3, we're in the wood. Remember... Twelve oh two. Um that work. And X one in Act 4, Scene 2, to the end, to the end of Act 5, are set in Athens, Acts 2, Acts 3, Act 4, Scene 1, set in the wood. You said 1202, right? 1202 in the 11th edition. I don't know what it is in the 10th. I don't have the syllabus in front of me. <coughs> so, <coughs> man, my throat's bothering me. Act 3, Scene 1, we see the rustics, the tradesmen, enter the wood because they're going to rehearse their play, which we find out on page 1203, line, we actually found out earlier, uh, the play is called The Most Lamentable Tragedy, uh, The Most Lamentable Comedy of the Death of Pyramus and, Tri uh, Pyramus and Thisbe. So they start rehearsing, and Puck comes in on page 1204, around line 58 or so. <clears throat> Puck says, What hemp and homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? And we're told this is an aside. An aside is a speech that only the audience hears. Okay? Nobody on the stage hears that. Usually the way it's done is the actor will come somewhat to the front of the stage and look out to the audience and say these lines. But it, it's clear from the asides. Nobody else ever hears this. All right? So Puck says this. Hemp and homespuns. He's just referring to the kind of clothes they're wearing. They're wearing, they're wearing simple homemade clothing. All right? And he wonders what they're doing. And then he realizes it's a play. I'll be an auditor. I'm going to watch. I'm going to listen. And then he adds, and maybe an actor too. Okay. So, bottom and flute begin their lines as Pyramus and Thisbe. And bottom has a point where he has to leave the stage, and then his cue calls him back in. Okay. His cue is, as true as true as horse that yet would never tire, that's when he's supposed to come back. So Bottom comes back in, and he now has an ass's head instead of his own head. And within the fiction of the play, his human head has literally been transformed into that of a jackass. Long snout, big ears, the whole nine yards, all right? Usually it's just a paper mache head put over the actor. Bottom comes in, recites his line, and Quint says, O oh, monstrous, O oh, strange, we are haunted, pray, and they all leave. Okay. Puck follows the other, at bottom stage on the stage, Puck follows all the others out into the wood and mimics and imitates voices to make them do various things. They come back in. Snout, for example, comes in and says, O oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? Bottom. What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Not realizing he has an ass's head now. So, little example of dramatic irony. Quince comes in. Bottom, thou art translated. He says, I see their knavery. That is, they're playing a joke on me. They want to make an ass of me. 
again, not realizing what he's saying. So, Quince is left, bottoms alone on the stage, other than Titania sleeping, and Bottom starts to sing. Why? Because it'll calm him down. He should not have a good singing voice. It should be like a donkey braying. Those little cocks are black of you. The orange tawny bill. Okay. And Titania awakes. Now remember, when Oberon put the juice into Tanya's eyes, let's see if I can find it real quickly. He says something to the effect of. Uh, Act 2, scene 2, line 33. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, part or boar with bristled hair, blah, 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 blah. So, when you wake, he says, take this thing for your true love. Notice he doesn't say, when you wake and see your love. This is going to be important because later on we're going to have somebody with the love juice put on his eyes and he's essentially on another person's eyes and Oberon is kind of going to say different words that imply when that person sees this other person the person's real love will be restored. In other words, it's not like the love potion is making something happened that the individual sleeping doesn't really want. See, if Titania were to awake, before he gets the love juice in her eyes, she obviously would not want to fall in love with Bottom, okay? So, she wakes up. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? Now, remember I just said, Bottom should sound horribly, like horrible like I just did. She calls his voice an angel angelic. It's not. Bottom keeps singing. Titania, 112. I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note, so is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy fair virtues forth perforce, perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. So, sing again, why? My, knee, my ear, mine ear, is much enamored of thy note. What does enamored mean? Literally, it's in love with. Or, in loved. Your note the note of his voice, she says, has entered my ears like love. Okay? What's, what's this telling us? Something's wrong with her ears, right? Love's guiding her ears, not her real hearing, because he's horrible sounding. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. What's enthralled mean? Enslaved. She doesn't have a choice in this. She's not saying, I don't have a choice. I am forced to love you. She is saying, I am under your spell. To be in thrall is to be under a person's spell. But that word thrall literally means slave. Okay? And she says, and thy fair virtue's force, its power, okay, does what? forces me to say, to swear, I love you, okay? She says she loves him because of his virtue, the virtue of his voice, the virtue of his appearance. What does he appear as? Remember when I had the great chain of being, you got the angels up here, fairies, humans, animals? What is bottom now? He's not just human. He has an assistant. He's not just an animal, he's a vix. That's why Quince says, oh, monstrous. Because what's a monster? It's a 
person that's not fully human. He's a, what's called today a chimera. He's a mixture of these things. So she says, get back to that again. Thy fair virtues force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Love at first sight. Bottom. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. <clears throat> Let's pause there. So, you have little reason for that. What's the that refer to? It's called the sentence compliment, by the way. It refers back to her previous sentence. What did she say? Your fair virtues force Poor force doth move me to swear to say, I love thee. You have little reason for that. True or false? It's true. She has no reason to say she loves Bottom. Describe to Tanya. What, she, what should she look like? Drop dead gorgeous. I mean, the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. Describe bottom. Not the most gorgeous, handsome man you've ever seen. He definitely can't, he doesn't have a nice voice. Okay? He has an ass's head. He, strange beyond all strangeness. So he says, to, he's not aware yet that he has an ass's head. There's nothing in the play that says Bottom has, you know, had an itch and scratched his ear and gone like this. But he says you should have little reason for that. Why? Does Bottom know she's a fairy? Possibly. But he's implying there's some difference between the two of them. Not she being female, he being male. He's implying there's some other qualitative difference between them. But then he goes on and says, and yet to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. What does that mean they keep little company together? They don't go hand in hand. Okay? Nowadays. He's implying sometime in the past, reason and love worked how? They worked in tandem. They worked together. In other words, love made sense at some time in the past. Now, they don't. And by saying that, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together, that little company is probably an example of the literary technique called litotes. Severe or exaggerated understatement. So if it's exaggerated understatement, how much company is little company? Zilch. Reason and love don't go together nowadays. He's saying. Okay? The more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Who would be the honest neighbors of reason and love? Where are reason and love located? Reason's up here. We, 2024, would say love's here in the heart. They wouldn't in Shakespeare's day. They would say love is one of the passions. It's down here in the gut, in the belly. What's between the head and the belly? The chest. It's from the chest that we get the will. The ability to choose, the ability to to enforce our decision, to act, okay? That is the company between reason and love. He's saying the will should bring these two things together. The problem is the will is governed by something else. The will acts because of the will, sorry, up here, acts either because the passions force it to, 
or reason forces it to. All this kind of language that I'm using comes from Aristotle, who said the human individual, the human person, has three faculties, the reason or mind, the will, volition, and those passions. And the one that should be on top is the one that is on top. The one that should govern is the reason. That's why it's at the highest point of the human body, according to Aristotle. And then the will comes next. The passions are the things that most of all ought to be controlled. Okay? So, reason and, tr reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. So what does he mean that they don't keep company? That they don't work in tandem? What's he saying about love? We just saw Tritanya say, I love you. It's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Anybody who's been, and look at the two terms I'm going to use, the two adverbs I'm going to use, madly, crazily in love is what? Mad and crazy. Not mad meaning angry. Mad meaning out of your mind. Why? Because people do stupid things for love. Things that don't make any rational sense. That's what Bottom is getting at. And he's saying it should make sense. Love should be not necessarily reasoned out. Not necessarily entirely logical. Like, you look at a quote-unquote prospective mate and go, has XYZ perfect qualities, you know, kind of a thing, and they cancel out these little bad... You know anybody who looks at another person that way? Not really. I mean, that may be how you vote for, you know, president or whatever. That's not how you choose someone to be with the rest of your life or whatever. Okay? She says, thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Okay, think about what she just said on its surface level. How beautiful is bottom? He's not. He's not. Ergo, therefore, if he's not beautiful, then how wise is he? He's not. It's hard. It's BS. Is it? Whose perspective was saying, thou art as wise as thou art beautiful? Titania's perspective. In Titania's eyes, bottom is what? Bottom is beautiful. Why? Where is love? We have a popular phrase. Love is in the eye of the beholder. That is, love doesn't inhere in each of you. It inheres in the eye of the person or persons who love you. It's not something in you per se. It's something they see in you. So when she says, thou art as wise as thou art beautiful, what is she saying? She's essentially saying, you know, you're right. Love and reason should go together. And what did she say in her previous speech? Go back to it, just briefly. Thy fair virtue's force, per force, doth move me. Move, that's the will, okay? On the first view to say, she is saying, looking at you, I see your virtues. That's a rational decision. In this, these virtues, Tell me I should love you. In fact, they make me swear I love you. Everything she's saying from her perspective makes perfect sense. She's saying my love is rational. She doesn't know about the potion. Shakespeare's raising issues of what is real love throughout this play. Bottom. Nope, not so neither. That is, I'm neither wise 
nor beautiful. But if I had wit to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. That is, from his perspective, he's not wise or beautiful. And I think possibly Shakespeare is suggesting maybe Bottom doesn't realize the wisdom of his own words. She says, oh, no, 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 you will not go out of this wood. No, I am a spirit of no camaraderie. I'm not some lowly peon fairy. She's the queen of the fairies. She says, and what I command is, you will stay here. How? Why? Because she's ordered it. Just as she said her eye is, en is enthralled to his shape and her ear is enamored to his voice, he is now enthralled, enslaved to her. Notice, he doesn't have a choice here. Okay? So, she calls her other fairies and they start to dote and feed Bottom and such, and they leave. Oberon comes in by himself, so he gets three lines, or not five lines, three lines before Puck comes in. And he comes out and he says, I wonder if Titania be awake. Now who is he saying it to? You don't have a little thing in brackets that says that aside. Is he just talking to himself? Could be. <clears throat> I always mention this when I teach this play. When my wife and I were in London in 2002, we, we got tickets to the Globe for Midsummer Night's Dream. We saw it twice. One of the times we got grounding tickets, so we were standing in the yard. And we got there early enough so that we could be right at the front of the stage. I mean, we were dead center, okay? And my wife's pretty short, and so when she'd go up to the stage, she could put her hands like this, her hands are on the stage, and it's right at her chin. The guy playing Oberon in Theseus, Scottish actor named Paul Higgins. I've never seen him in anything else. I don't think he's ever done any film or TV. I think he's only a theater actor. Really good looking guy. Great, you know, build and everything. And this Scottish accent that just melts my wife like butter, because she likes Scots. He comes out for the, so we're standing, she's like this, dead center. He comes out and gets down on his knees like this far away from her and says, I wonder if Titania be awake. And I'm kind of, and my wife says, yes. You know, 3,000 sets of eyes. And they start ad-libbing for about three minutes. And he's like, no. She goes, yes. Really? Yes. And finally, then what was it that next came in her eye? And I think my wife said something like a monster or a man with an S said, no. And he's just, you know, eating it up. Just before he leaves, he kind of winks at her, nods at her, gets up at the end of the play when they come out for their bows. He does this. Okay. All that's just a little demonstration for good actors when they have the environment for it. They will draw the audience in. They will involve the audience. It's one thing they do at the Globe. They have actors enter the stage from the midst of the yard. I mean, they'll come running through the yard and push people out of the way. Sometimes they drag people. Sometimes they take people's food, literally. Okay, They do all this stuff. So, Puck comes in. My mistress of the monster is in love. Talks about what happened. Talks about the play that they were putting on. Oberon. <clears throat> Line 35. Act 3, scene 2. This falls out better than I could devise. Remember, when he put the juice in her eyes, what did he hope that she would fall in love with? An animal. A boar, a boar, a bull, a bear, a cat, etc. What's she falling in love with? Not an animal. But not a human. It's even worse than just an animal. Okay? So, Oberon, that's all he's concerned about? No. He says, but hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juice, as I bid thee do? Why does he care? Why does he care about Helena's requital of love by Demetrius? 
Why does he want to make sure that Demetrius falls in love with Elena? It's never really answered. But yeah, I did. I found him. He was sleeping. I did that. Demetrius and Hermia come in. Oberon, here he is. Puck, hmm. That's the woman, but that's not the man. Meaning, hmm, I didn't put juice in his eyes. Demetrius, oh, why are you root? Blah, blah, blah. Why rebuke you him that loved you so? Right? Why did Demetrius go into the wood? To follow Hermia and Lysander. Hermia says, if you have slain Lysander, because remember, she woke up, and where was Lysander? Gone. If you've slain Lysander in his sleep, kill me too. She wants to know where Lysander is. He says, I don't know. They talk back and forth. Hermia leaves, line 81, and Demetrius says, there is no following her, following her in this fierce vein. That is, I'm not going to get any sense out of her. And he lies down and goes to sleep. Oberon kind of steps forward. So Demetrius is asleep. What hast thou done? He should say it angrily like I just kind of did. He's really upset. Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love site. How does he know? How does he know that Puck put it on some true lover's site? Has, has Theseus, um, Oberon, seen Lysander in the wood? Not that we've seen. But being the king of fairies, he's probably it's probably understood that he knows he's there. Who? What other Athenians are in the wood right now? Well, you've got the rustics, the guys putting on the play. They were in the play, or they were in the wood, at least. Demetrius, Lysander, pretty much that's it. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love site. Of thy misprision, your gloss, mistake, okay, must perforce ensue some true love turned and not a false turn true. So when they enter the wood, Hermia and Lysander love each other. When he enters the wood, he loves Hermia. When she enters the wood, she loves Demetrius. Okay? So he says, you've turned some true love, now false. We don't know how exactly yet. Okay? Puck, then fate overrules. Right? Just like we saw in the two Oedipus plays. What do both those plays essentially teach? If something is fated, it's going to happen. Period. End of debate. Then fate overrules that what? One man holding troth, that is, one man being faithful in marriage, one or, or a love relationship, one man being loyal in a love relationship, a million fatal, confounding oath on the oath. For every one true love relationship, there are a million failures. What's that saying about love? Not even a crapshoot, man. That's like, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than to find true love, true, faithful love. He's saying, Oberon. Go about the wood, find Helena of Athens. What did Oberon not do before when he told Puck to find the Athenian youth and the Athenian maid? You'll know by their clothes. He didn't say find Demetrius of Athens and Helena of Athens. Find Helena of Athens, 
how fancy sick, sick she is, pale of cheer, etc. By some illusion, bring her here and make her go to sleep next to him. Why? I'll charm his eyes against she do appear. I'll put a charm in his eyes so that when he wakes up, he will see her and will love her. <coughs> Puck, look, I'll go. And so he goes. So Oberon takes the juice and applies it to Demetrius's eyes. And he says, flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archer eye, that is Cupid's arrow, making whatever is hit by it fall in love, sink in apple of his eye, that is the pupil. When his love he doth espy, Notice, what does that mean? When his love he sees. Go back to what he said to Titania. When she opens her eyes, she will see her love. That is, the thing she will be in love with. Here, it's implied, when she opens her eyes, her love she will see. Notice the distinction? This one is the thing, excuse he will. The thing he really loves is what he will see. With Titania, the thing she sees is what she will come to really love. It's like this time, what's going to happen? Demetrius will come to his senses. How do we know? When Demetrius was first introduced, what did Lysander say about him? Before he ever saw Hermia, he made love to Nadar's daughter and won her heart. That's why she's following him. Okay? And then he did what? And then he saw Hermia. And it was like, ooh, a shiny new thing. A brand new car, a brand new woman. And his eye went from the one he loved to the nice shiny new one. You know, kind of the uh, trophy wife, so to speak. When his love he doth despise, let her shine as glorious lie. All those words rhymed in Shakespeare's day. As the Venus of the sky, let her look like what? Okay, he is talking about the star, the planet, excuse me the planet Venus, but he's also talking about the goddess of love. When thou wakes, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. How would he beg of her for remedy? That she would return his love. That's it. Pop comes in. Here's Helena. And he says, and the youth mistook by me, that is, the youth, he put the juice on, Lysander, shall we their fond pageant see? Excuse me. And the youth mistook by me, pleading for a lover's fee, for payment, essentially, for her to return his love. Why? Because Lysander no longer loves uh, Hermia. Lysander now loves Helena. So what has happened? The lovers all go into the forest for what purpose? These two to get married. This one because he's pursuing her because he loves her, so he thinks. This one because she loves him, or so she thinks. Now, Notice, nobody loves properly. I mean, yeah, Herbius still loves Lysander, but his eyes are set on somebody new. Okay. Notice, by the way, what we're going to see happen is his sight gets fixed, his sight gets fixed. These two, they never had any problems with their loves or their loving. So, that's why Puck says, shall we their fond pageant see? 
fawn pageant. Their foolish acting, their foolish actions. Why will it be foolish? Lord, what fools these mortals be. Why are they fools? What's causing them to act the way they are? Louder? Love. love. They're acting out of love. They're not acting out of reason. Okay? And you could even say here, are they really even acting out of love? It's a potion put in their eyes. So, Oberon says, stand aside. They're going to wake up Demetrius. Puck. Ooh, that's even better. Then will two at once woo one. Then these two are going to fall in love or woo her because this gets erased. Okay. Lysander comes in. He and Helena talk back and forth. And Demetrius wakes up. Oh, hell and goddess meant perfect divine. To what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? And he goes off with these comparisons. And she says, oh, spite, oh, hell, I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. Meaning, why are you playing this practical joke on me? She never wanted Lysander to love her. She wanted Demetrius. So if Lysander were out of the picture, this would be great. Why does she think Demetrius is playing a joke on her? Everything from the beginning of the play. How's he treated her? Dog. Kicked her. Spanked her. Not that kind of thing. You know, beat. You know, no S&M stuff, right? I've had students go, boy, you know, there's all... No. He's treated her horribly. Okay? So she thinks they're playing this joke on her. That she's the butt of the joke. She says, in fact, you would not use a gentle lady so, line 152, uh, 151. If you were men as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so to vow and swear and super praise my parts when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. Right? Because he loves her, according to Helena's thinking, and he loves her. She has no one's love. And now you are both rivals to mock Helena. I stand here. Demetrius, you are unkind. You love Hermia. You know that I know. And you can have Hermia, he says. In Hermia's love, I yield up my part. I no longer love Hermia. She's yours. Demetrius, you can have Hermia. I will none. That is, I don't want any part of her. My love is gone. My heart to her, but as guest-wise, line 171, sojourned. <clears throat> His heart sojourned as a guest to Hermia. Oh, what the hell does that mean? I was on a trip. Hermia was Holiday Inn. I stayed there. My heart stayed there for a while. But as all good trips come to an end, it was time for his heart to return home, and it did. And now <laughs> he's putting it, sojourning somewhere else. And now to Helen is it home returned. Why is Helen its home and not himself? We're going to hear him tell us in Act 4, Scene 1. That is, Lysander is going to admit to what Demetrius said in Act 1, Scene 1. In fact, he's going to tell us a little bit more than what Demetrius said. When Demetrius said he wooed Helen and won her heart. All right? Uh, Lysander, Helen, it is not so. Demetrius says, Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest do thy peril. So what does Lysander mean? Helen, it is not so. Don't believe him. He's lying. Think reasonably. Think rationally. Who's got the better argument at this point? Lysander or Demetrius? Has Lysander 
ever treated Helen horribly, or Helena horribly? No, he hasn't. Demetrius has. So Lysander's like, you can't believe him. Why can't she? Because earlier he said he loved her, then he said he loved Hermia. Now he's back to loving her? Come on, man, make up your mind. That's Lysander's point. Hermia comes in. She says, I heard Lysander's voice. It drew her. She says, but why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why, Lysander, did you leave me sleeping? Lysander, why should he stay whom love doth press to go? Press. Press is, it's a, it's a British military term. And it refers to finding soldiers to go off to war. You press innocent, non-warrior men. That is, a group of military officers go into a town, they go into the pubs and bars and such, and they say, you, 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 and you, come with me. They put them in shackles and take them off to battle. Release the shackles there, or take them off to a naval vessel, a ship and they get pressed into service. He says, what love could force, could press me to go? Hermia doesn't understand that. What could press you from my side? What were their last words to each other before they went to sleep? I will love you till what? Until the day I die. Lysander, Lysander's love, that's, that's what made me move. Notice, love is taking or is forcing the will to do something, he suggested. Fair, Hel Fair Helena, who more engilds the night than all young fiery O's and eyes of light, why seekst thou me? He's saying, Helena is what moved me. Why? She he says, in guilds the night. The night's black, right? It's dark. In guild means to cover it with gold. She brings the light wherever she is. Could not this make thee know, hate I bear thee, leave thee, leave thee so? Now he's talking like Demetrius did to Helena before. She goes, no, no, no. You cannot, you speak not as you think. It cannot be. No. You don't mean that. Helena, she's one of this confederacy. Why does, what does she mean she's one of this confederacy? Earlier she said, why do you all mock me? Why do you all scorn me? Talking to Demetrius and Lysander. The confederacy, all three of them. She thinks... The three of them have plotted to turn her into the butt of a joke. She suggested the three of them plotted this whole thing of going into the wood for the simple reason of picking on her, of mocking and scorning her. And so she turns to Hermia and talks about their past together, all the good times they had. Why would you do this to me? I've always been your best friend. Hermia. What are you talking about? Helena, have you, you set Lysander as in scorn to follow and praise me? Didn't you put Lysander up to this? What's Helena suggesting here? Lysander is doing your bidding. Why? Because he still really loves you. He doesn't really love me. Hermia, skip down to the end of that passage, line 236. I don't know what you mean by what are you talking about? I persevere. Counterfeit said persevere. Persevere. Keep it up. Pretend you're sad. Make mouths upon me as I turn my back. That is, I know what you all are up to. When I turn my back, you're going to whisper things to each other. Wink at each other. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. That is, someone will write about this. This sport, this game, this joke you've played. 
if you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. That is, something for other people to write about. But fare ye well, tis partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Hermia and Lysander finished their speech, their little scene before they went to sleep, with, essentially, till death do us part, she is saying, I get it, some of this is my own fault. Why? Because of how she fawned and doted after Demetrius. But now she says, Fare ye well, because death or absence soon shall remedy. Absence. I'm going to leave. That could be one remedy. What else? Or death could be the remedy. Now, death's not very lighthearted. What is she suggesting? If I can't have Demetrius' love, life's not worth living. Lysander, stay gentle, Helena. Hear my excuse. Stop, 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 stop. Understand me. My life, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Helena, oh, excellent. She doesn't mean, oh, I get it. She means, really? She still thinks he's being facetious. Hermia, sweet, do not scorn her so. Hermia understands Helena is serious when she talks about either my leaving or my death will be the remedy. The resolution of your joke. Don't pour gasoline on the fire, Hermia is saying to Lysander. Demetrius, if she cannot entreat, that is, if Hermia can't beg you to stop, I can compel. Come on, you and I, let's take it outside. Lysander, really? All right, let's do it. Okay, so Hermia jumps onto Lysander or tries to. Why? Because she's still madly in love. She's going to do what? She's going to fight for a man. She's going to hold on to him. He tries to break away. Lysander says to her, hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing, let loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Cat, burr, serpent. They're all small. This is the first indication we get about Hermia's size. Okay? Hermia, Hermia doesn't understand why he's acting this way. Lysander, out, tawny tartar. Referring to color, dark-skinned. They go back and forth. Hermia, when Lysander says, although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. 271. Because Dimitri says, come on, man. She's weak. You can You can get away from her if you wanted to. He says, I'm not going to hurt her. Hermia, what can you do me greater harm than hate? She says, your physical harm would, would be nothing compared to hating me. Why? Am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? That is, aren't we like, you know, peanut butter and bread? Don't we just naturally go together? I'm as fair now as erstwhile. I'm as beautiful now as I was yesterday. What's happened? Lysander. I never did desire to see thee more. Therefore, be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain nothing truer. Tis no jest. I'm not joking that I do hate thee and love Helena. Now, Helena's still there. But she still thinks this is all part of a game. Hermia then does something Helena doesn't expect. Hermia turns on Helena. You juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Remember her dream? She wakes up, Lysander's not there, and she says she has a nightmare that a serpent 
came and ate her heart. She's suggesting Helena is the serpent. Helena, have you no modesty? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you. Your gloss says for puppet, counterfeit, like a doll, kind of, or dwarfish woman, in reference to Hermia's smaller stature. Well, what else, what else is a puppet? It's top surface level meaning. You can wear a hand puppet, you know, that you do this and it moves. Or you can use a puppet like a marionette where you have strings and such. Either way, they're both moved by something else. They're manipulated. I think Helena is saying Hermia is being manipulated. She might also definitely be referring to Hermia's size. How do we know? Because that's what Hermia latches on to. The only reason Hermia latches on to this idea of puppet having reference to size is why. And you have to understand the mindset. She's a short person. Okay? And has a very big chip on her shoulder about being short. One of my daughters is like 5'1", five 5'2", five on a good day, you know, she really does that. My other daughter's like 5'6". It drives the shorter daughter just absolutely bonkers crazy that her younger sister is taller than she is. The, older, the younger sister also has the wavy curly hair that, you know, most women die for. Puppet? Aye, that way goes the game. Sure. Uh, oh, oh, okay, I get it. She hath made compare between our statures. And this is where we find out Helena should be tall. Her tall personage. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth, she hath... Okay, the very fact that she's mentioned height like two or three times now is telling us. Hermia has a problem with her size, okay? And are you grown so high in his esteem because I'm so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Painted maypole, maypole has reference to the rites of the first day of May where lovers would do this thing and they would dance around a maypole with these big long streamers and tie them up around the maypole. The painted maypole, painted there refers not only to the literal Paint that's on the maypole. But paint here also refers to the usage in Shakespeare's day of painted referring to the makeup women put on. All right? And why do women wear makeup? To make themselves prettier. Throughout Shakespeare's sonnets and in several other plays, he uses the trope of a not quite beautiful woman putting makeup on and becoming beautiful, emphasizing the artificialness of that beauty, all right? Today we could say, well, maybe it's not makeup. Maybe it's plastic surgery. Look at, look at so many of the so-called influencers, Instagram and such, who have plastic surgery to make them look like what? <laughs> not what they were before. Or look at actresses. I used an example in my two classes yesterday. Uh -oh. <sighs> Film When Harry Met Sally with Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan, who was the it girl for rom-coms in the late 80s. Billy Crystal, Tom Hanks, she did a whole bunch of them. Because she's just cute. Blonde hair, perfect face, all nine yards. She's my age. So she's like 60 or 62. I'm 62. She had plastic surgery a couple of years ago to try to look like she did in 1985. Doesn't work because it looks like someone 
melting plastic on her face. Okay? That's what she's getting at with the painted maypole thing. Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach. And, and she jumps. And a couple of productions I've seen, Hermia literally jumps up and Helena kind of has to hold her off. Well, the other, Demetrius and Alexander, help hold her off. Notice, Helena, I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. Like, I'm too high-minded to get involved in a fight. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. What does she mean by shrewishness? Notice, you don't have a gloss. But Shakespeare wrote a play, The Taming of the Shrew, about a woman named Kate who hated all men, didn't want anything to do with them. She was called a shrew because of her attitude, right? So when she says, I have no gift for shrewishness, she means for this kind of insolent hatred and action towards men. But what does the word come from? A shrew which is a little tiny mammal, like a mouse. In Hermia's ears, ears, what has Helena just done? Really? You just compared me to about the smallest mammal there is? You perhaps may think because she is something like 305, lower than myself, that I can match her. 305, you got a gloss. Somewhat lower. Helen is talking about size, and Hermia knows that. Lower again. So Helena tries to smooth the waters to calm Hermia's ruffled feathers. You and I were always friends. And she tells us, I, I'm not lying to you. I, I didn't ever wrong you, except, okay. Moment of truth, I told Demetrius what you and Lysander were planning. Why? Because I knew he would come out in the wood to follow you, and thereby I could follow him. Sorry, sorry. Just let me go back to Athens, she says. 3.15. If you will let me quiet go, to Athens will I bear my folly back, my foolishness and follow you no further. What was her foolishness? She was acting out of love. Oh, look what fools these mortals be, Puck said. It was foolish to think she would somehow win his love by telling him this. She says, I will bear my folly, ba follow, folly back and follow you no further. Who's the you? All of them. I'm going to update terminology a little bit. It's not quite accurate, but it fits a bit. F you. I'm done, she's saying. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Hermia, get! Go! Who's stopping you? It's like if they were in a room, she'd go, there's the door. Hermia, uh, Helena, what hinders you? What hinders me? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. How? How does she leave her foolish heart behind? What did Lysander say, excuse me, what did Demetrius say about his heart? He said, I was like on a sojourn, and my heart sojourned for a while with Hermia, and now it has, he said, returned home, not to him, but to Helena. Helena says, she's gonna go back to Athens but she's going to leave her foolish heart here. Why? Where? With Demetrius. What's she telling us? She still loves him. 
no matter everything that's happened, that she will go back to Athens and live what? Live what kind of life? Single. She's saying, all my love is here. I will never find another love. Okay? What? With Lysander? Hermia. What, you're leaving your love with Lysander? She goes, no. With Demetrius. Okay? So, Demetrius and Lysander start saying things back and forth about Hermia and leaving Helena alone. Lysander leaves. Demetrius says, I'll follow you. And then cheek by jowl, meaning they're going to fight. Because they still have to resolve. Who gets Helena? Okay. Helena leaves. Hermia leaves. Oberon and Puck step forward. This is thy negligence. Meaning, Puck, this is your fault. This what? Everything they've just seen. Now, but when that scene began, what did Puck say? Oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. Because two will at once woo one. Oh, and it's going to... This is thy negligence. Still thou mystic. Still means constantly. Continuously. All the time. You screw up. Or, what's the difference between screwing up Doing it intentionally. That's not a screw up. That's plotting. You can accidentally kill someone. Or you can premeditate it. Huge difference between third degree and first degree manslaughter. Or homicide. So. Puck. Believe me. I mistook. What did you say? You said look for a man in Athenian garments. Wearing Athenian garments. It wasn't my fault. So I anointed an Athenian's eyes and so far and glad am I glad it did it so did sort. Why? Because this they're jangling. What's their jangling? They're fighting. What kind of what kind of talk should these four be having? It should be harmonious. It should be concordant, not discordant. He says, this they're jangling, I esteem a sport. What's mean, what does he mean by sport? He doesn't mean like football, track, soccer, hockey. But every one of those sports involves what? Why do the athletes in those sports do those sports? Spectators. That's why. He says, oh, this was the best spectator thing in the world. Oberon, these lovers are finding a place to fight. So here's what I want you to do. Overcast the night, make it so they can't see anything, and lead them in such a fashion so that Lysander falls asleep next to whom? Hermia. Demetrius falls asleep next to Helena, and we will anoint their eyes, these two, so that when they wake up, what? They will see as they should see. 367. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous proper tie. Okay? Virtuous, that means powerful, efficacious, property. To take from thence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight, that is, as they used to. That when they next wake, all this derision, and your gloss says something about laughable business, okay, will what? Seem like a dream and fruitless vision. So, He's going to see as he was wont to see. He will be in love with Hermia. What about him? When was he wont to be, see, Helena as the object of his love? 
before the play opened, after he won her heart. So the juice here is not a love potion. It's not the same, even if it's the same juice, it's doing what? It's restoring true love to their sight. It's not making them something they sh should not love, love, like it did with Titania's eyes. Okay? So, we see Lysander, we see Puck leading them all around, and we see the four lovers fall asleep. Okay? Puck um, they lie down and sleep. Puck goes to Lysander's eyes and says, 452 or so. They'll start there, 449. On the ground sleep sound, I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, Remedi. When thou wakes, thou takes true delight in the light of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb, gnome, every man should take his own. In your waking shall be shown, Jack shall have Jill. And what he's getting at there is, this is the nature of things. This is how it is all supposed to be. All right? Act four. We're still in the wood. The lovers are asleep on the stage. Titania comes in with Bottom and her followers. They sing Titania and Bottom to sleep. Titania wraps herself all around Bottom and talks about you know, uh, like a um, wild honeysuckle vine out in the woods growing around a local tree and stuff. That's how she wraps herself around bottom. They fall asleep. <coughs> Oberon says, see this? Her dotage now I begin to pity. There's that word dotage again. A dote. We've seen it several times. It always implies what? Irrational unreasonable, against logical action. Okay. He says, I met her lately in the wood, and I upbraided her for our falling out. And he says what? I persuaded her to give me the young child. How did he persuade her? He couldn't persuade her when we first saw the two of them. So what has happened that made him able to persuade her. She's not thinking properly. Why? Everything she does is for Bottom's benefit. She's like, oh, little, yeah, you can have the little boy. Bottom. So he says, I begged the child. She gave it to me. I sent him off to my bower in fairyland. And now I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. Why is it an imperfection? Who should she dote on? Oberon. And General Puck, take this transforming scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he, awaking when the other do, will go back to Athens, repair, again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, and again we hear, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. Because what bearing, what effects, what results, what consequences do dreams have in the waking, rational world? None. They're effervescent, and then they go away. And he says to her, when he squeezes the herb on her eyes, be as thou was wont to be. Be as you used to be. See as thou was wont to see. See as you used to see. Diane's bud over Cupid's flower has such force and blessed power. Diane's bud, Diana, the goddess of chastity, chasteness. What's he saying? Diana's bud, Diana's power, he says, is stronger than Cupid's flower. So is he saying he wants her to be celibate from here on out? Nope. Chaste in this context is chaste in a marriage relationship. His alone. No more running after Theseus. 
just as he will no longer run after Philida, right? He's saying our marriage from this point on suggests will be chaste. So he says, now my Titania, wake you my sweet queen. No longer is she a wanton. And she wakes up. Now, bear in mind, physically, how is she situated on the stage? She has her arms, and probably legs, wrapped around bottom. She hears her husband wake her. She looks at him, so she's looking him in the face while holding him. What visions have I seen? He thought, notice, my Oberon, mine, <laughs> you belong to me. What visions have I seen? He thought I was enamored of an ass. He goes, there you go, lies your love. And I think if I were directing, I would have them entwined so that she turns from looking at his face to Bottom's face. But Bottom is still, Bottom's is still an ass's face at this point so that she probably lets go quickly. It says, how came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Okay, what is that? How, how the, came these things to pass? What does that mean? How the hell did this happen? Look at Oberon's response. Silence a while. Shh. Don't worry about it. Does he ever tell her? Not within the play. You know, let's play a little mind, mind experiment for a moment here. Let's, let's add to the play. <laughs> let's go to the scene where Oberon tries to explain how she fell in love with this monstrous thing. How do you think that's going to go over? Oh, well, I put some love potion in your eyes so that you fell in love with this guy. Mm, probably not good. Don't think they're going to have that conversation. Okay? So... They sing and dance and stuff. They all leave the stage. Theseus enters. It says, call the forester. They're there to perform their, their rites of love. It's referred to as a May Day celebration, but it's not in May. It's all that means, the rites of May is celebration of love. Why? What day is it? It's the fourth day from the beginning of the play. It's the day of their marriage, okay? And he and Hippolyte, Theseus and Hippolyta are talking. Page 1222, line 123 or so. 122, Theseus says, but soft, in other words, what the hell? What nymphs are these? He sees Hermia and he sees Helena. Aegeus, uh, this is my daughter, but, and that's Lysander next to her, and here's D Demetrius, and there's Helena. I wonder, meaning I am amazed at what, what could explain this. Theseus, well, they got up early to do the rite of May in, in anticipation of our wedding, okay? Is this the day Hermia has to decide whether she's going to die or be forced into you know marriage she doesn't want, or become a nun to chastity. Uh, yeah, wake them up. So they're awakened. Theseus, what gives? You two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world? What does concord literally mean? Con co with together, so it implies a oneness, cord, heart. How are you guys all peacefully at one here? Lysander, oh, I will reply amazedly. Amazedly means I don't know. Half sleep, half waking? Like, is this still part of the dream? Um, Hermia and I came here to get married outside the law of Athens. Aegeus. That's it. Enough. I don't need any more. The law. Problem with that, they're not in Athens. The law doesn't extend to where they are. Now, if they carry them back to Athens, okay, that's one thing. 
Demetrius. He says, Demetrius, he would have taken away what is yours by right. Demetrius, my lord, notice, fair Helen. Fair Helen told me of their stealth, of this their purpose thither to this wood. I in fury hither followed them. Fair Helen in fancy, that is, in foolishness, really, but in fantasy, in imagination, driven by love, your gloss says, following me. My good Lord, I want not, that is, I know not by what power, but by some power it is, my love to Hermia melted as the snow. It seems to me now as the remembrance of an idol god, which in my childhood I did dote upon. What's an idol god? Your gloss says, worthless trinket. Not, a, not that helpful. What, what would be a worthless trinket that a child would dote upon? shiny new toy. That's what it means. He says, Hermia was like a shiny new toy that I doted upon, paid too much attention to. But now, he says, all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of my eye is only Helena. And then he tells us one other thing. To her, my lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia. We knew he wooed her. We knew he won her heart. We did not know that they were engaged. So when he broke with Helena to go after Hermia, it wasn't just, sorry, honey, I want something or someone else. It was a breaking of an oath, a breaking of a vow. All right? That's how bad Demetrius was. But he says, now, as in health, I come to my natural taste. I wish it, love it, long for it. It will forevermore be true to it, you know. Helena, Theseus, cool. That's what he means by you are fortunately met. You are fortunately met. Fortune, the goddess, has smiled on you two. You are met. And you too. Why? Because now those loves are restored. See, Theseus didn't know anything about what happened here. At this point, Theseus doesn't know that Lysander fell for Helena and that Demetrius fell for Helena early in the wood too. He says, no, we're going to hear more about this later, but right now, Aegeus, I overbear your will that is just shut up. I'm Duke. What I say goes. In the temple, what? With us, these couples shall eternally be knit. There's going to be three weddings today. Not just one. So, let's go to Athens. The Duke, Hippolyta, their train, their followers all leave. And we get the four lovers remaining behind. Hermia, methinks I see these things with parted eye, parted, improperly focused, like, is this really happening? Helena, me too, and I found Demetrius like a jewel, my own, and not my own. Gloss, like a jewel that one finds by chance and therefore possesses, but cannot certainly consider one's own property. Hmm, Demetrius, are you sure we're awake? It seems like we yet sleep, we dream. Do not you think that wasn't the Duke here? And follow, yeah, and my father, and we're going to get married. Yep. Yeah. All right. So they all leave. Who's been on the stage the whole time? Asleep. Bottom. Bottom now wakes up. The ass's head is gone. And he thinks of the play. It's like everything from when he fell asleep initially till now, it's all a dream. And he says, I've had a most rare vision. Line 198. I have had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. I've had a dream past the wit, the intelligence, the reason, the rationality. 
the ability of man to say what the dream was. And then what does Bottom try to do? He tries to say what the dream was. If the dream is beyond the ability of man to say what it is, and then you try to say what it is, what does that make you? An idiot. A moron. A fool. Okay? Methought I was. Uh, back up. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. See, you don't have, an ass, have to have an ass's head in order to be an ass. Methought I was. There's no man can tell what. I thought I was. Methought I hmm. Man is but a patch fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. And then he uses this language. This is bastardized paraphrase of St. Paul, one of the Corinthians, I believe. The eye of man hath not heard. Well, that's true, because eyes don't hear. See, he, he means the ear of man, but he mixes them up. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. He goes, I'm going to have a quince, write it out, and we'll do it as an epilogue to the play. Okay? Scene two. We're now back in Athens. And we're going to be in Athens till the end of the play. Okay? We have the rude mechanicals, the rustics. And Bottom shows up. And Bottom tells them their play is preferred. We don't know how Bottom knows this. All right? Act 5, we're now at the Palace of Theseus. I'm going to stop here because we're going to spend a bit of time with Theseus' opening speech. So we'll stop there. See, on Thursday, uh, I'm going to put up, I won't do it till Thursday. I'll put up on Thursday 